Our last speaker this morning is Saul Cabrera, staff developer at Shopify. He's passionate about functional programming, concurrency, compilers, and computer science. He has been involved in a variety of open source projects and regularly gives back to the community, primarily through code contributions and documentation. He is speaking today on WASM from the Inside Out, a journey through the impact of WebAssembly in production. Please help me welcome Saul. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. So um, this talk is about a journey through the impact of WebAssembly in production from um, the perspective of Shopify. And here Shopify is mostly um, an example, uh, just to pick some, is the, is the use case that I'm most familiar with and I think is going to highlight where WASM was when we adopted it and where it's now. Um, so my name is Saul Cabrera and I work in engineering at Shopify. Um, and you might ask yourself, well, why I'm giving this talk? Um, but mainly because I've been working in several um, places in the stack um, by need, uh, but because it was needed in, able, in order to enable Shopify functions. So the first uh, place that I was introduced to Wasm was Shopify functions, which is where we at Shopify use Wasm. Then I've also been involved in creating a JavaScript on WebAssembly toolchains like Javi, and also my latest project is working on a baseline compiler for Wasm time in order to improve um, startup times. So as you can see, this goes from highest levels of the stack all the way down to uh, low level, and this is why this talk is called From the Inside Out. We're going to see how these uh, low level pieces have made of Wasm what it is today. Um, so in order to understand the context of this talk a bit more, we need to understand how a Shopify uses Wasm. Um, and so my colleague, Duncan, wrote this article um, back in 2021, and you can refer to it if you're interested in all the details. But um, the use case behind Shopify's adoption of WebAssembly is really extensibility. And extensibility means opening Shopify's backend for execution of third-party code as a way to customize business logic. Um, and to concretize a bit more the concept of extensibility, we can take a look at the personas involved in extending um, Shopify. The first persona is a merchant, which is really important. It's someone that wants to sell physical or digital goods online. Then the second persona that comes around is the buyer. The buyer is someone that wants to buy something from a merchant. The third um, persona here is a developer, which is a third party developer that creates um, an application to enhance Shopify's functionality. Um, that could be similar to how uh, other developers create apps for the iOS app store. Um, and in the middle of these uh, personas, we have Shopify functions, which enable complex interactions between uh, these three personas. Now, I'm gonna make a step back from Shopify right now and just make a reference to a talk that I gave back in WebAssembly Summit in 2021, where I pointed out some challenges regarding adopting WebAssembly at the time. Um, this talk presented an analogy between Wasm and the Concorde, you know, this airplane that was revolutionary to the aviation industry. And the analogy basically was that the Concorde was really great, revolutionary, but it was expensive to get access to by the masses. So tickets were like 12K uh, per person. So this was one of the factors that made WebAssembly, uh, sorry, the Concorde fail. And so I was making the analogy that if Wasm keeps being expensive to get access to, it might fail too. And so with this talk, I want to take a moment to reflect on those challenges and also celebrate because I think that those challenges have, have been solved. Um, and so I want to reflect on those and just make sure that we um, can get a sense of how those challenges have been solved now. Um, and so the challenges that I was mentioning in that talk is that authoring programs was hard. Um, the lack of non-system programs targeting WASM was basically non-existent. Um, the other challenge is that understanding programs was hard. Debugging a, a WebAssembly program or knowing what this program was doing was hard too. It was not evident how to do it correctly. And the third uh, challenge is that guest host interaction was, was really complicated. The amount of glue code that you needed to write in order to make sure that you could pass complex types around was um, hard. So let's go back to 12, uh, 2014. In 2014, Wasm was not ready to be adopted, I think. Um, but Shopify was already thinking about solving problems that would be a perfect fit for Wasm's model. And the core problem at the time, and this is still the core problem today, but with better tools, is to enable more complex interactions between a merchant and the buyer. 
So in the end, when you buy something, what you're doing is you're finalizing a purchase proposal. And that proposal can have infinite terms, right? And those terms might only mean something to the merchant and the buyer. So Shopify as a platform doesn't really need to know and encode all those terms because this is going to make Shopify hard to scale and hard to maintain. So by 2014, extensibility was handled um, as a product at Shopify. And the solution that was proposed was um, having a light Ruby VM. In this case, we were using mRuby um, secured through SecComp. Um, if you attended yesterday's Dan Goldman's talk, uh, he did mention SecComp. But for those of you who are not familiar, SecComp is a feature of the Linux kernel to um, secure system calls, basically. Um, this solution also had to be fast because all these, trans all these um, customizations are happening at checkout where this code, this third-party code is running inline. So you can imagine that you cannot delay the process of determining if a purchase, uh, if a purchase needs a discount, for example. And so this solution solved a particular business problem. It worked and it was designed uh, with um, a specific need in mind with the tools available at the time. But the question was, it, is it going to be scalable? Can this be improved? And um, the answer is that there were several cons that uh, came around uh, over time. And one of the first ones was op optimization opportunities were tied to the RVM itself. Um, now, general second um, drawbacks too came around. Um, also, uh, this solution was not polyglot, meaning that you were tied to Ruby as a language. So uh, thinking about supporting another language like JavaScript, for example, meant having to adopt a new engine like V8 or SpiderMonkey or whichever any other JavaScript engine would that be. And then the fourth challenge here was um, storing untrusted code efficiently. As you can imagine, depending on what language you're choosing, that's how you're going to be storing your source code and this can be this could mean um, wasting space uh, if this can be compact and, and efficient. So we fast forward to 2018 and the buyer and merchant interactions is trying to get more complex and harder to handle and scale. And the need for new use cases arose and it was hard to think about scaling the current product into a platform to handle more demand. So by the time a hack uh, using a WASM interpreter written in Go showed that this new WebAssembly thing could be leveraged as an alternative, uh, potentially removing the need to maintain um, many of the, of the key features in-house, like for example, security, right? So this new solution was uh, in theory polyglot. Uh, it was secure, which one was one of the main selling points of this new solution, and it was performant. Um, an interpreter wouldn't cut our performance requirements, but thankfully at the time, Fastly open sourced um, Lucid, which was um, the first, I think, ahead of time WASM compiler and runtime that we eventually adopted. And Lucid represented a major step up in performance um, over the interpreter-based approach that, that we had. And all the work behind Lucid uh, enabled the first iteration of a new platform to enable synchronous execution of untrusted code. And so here I have this small chart of one of the initial experiments that we did. Uh, and here you can see that we have 100K WASM modules running for five minutes, um, uh, per minute running for five minutes, and in which the P99 was around five milliseconds, which is pretty good for what we were looking at the time. Um, eventually, given all the efforts that went into WASM time and Lucid and these two merged, we ended up adopting WASM time, which is our runtime of choice uh, today. Now, um, more questions came after the initial option of WebAssembly and after having proven that it fits the needs of the platform. And one of the first questions that came around was, well, um, what's the path to enable other languages to run fast on WASM? Because you know, uh, C, Rust, C++ are cool, but they're system programming languages and not everyone wants to use them to write extensibility code, which is fair, given that everything that Shopify does for partners is written in, in uh, TypeScript or JavaScript. And pre-initializing WebAssembly modules was in great part the answer to this question. So this pre-initialization process was provided by this tool called Wiser, which is used in many other projects um, in the Biker Alliance to enable um, other languages to run in WebAssembly. And so with Wiser, we were able to snapshot a module ahead of time to improve startup latency. Um, in the context of dynamic languages, you can, like for example, JavaScript, um, we could generate a snapshot modules 
which most, if not all, of the JavaScript initialization work will be completed ahead of time. In fact, there is a very good article written um, uh, in the Bike Alliance blog that explains all this in detail, so if you're interested, uh, you can go and read that one. Um, but Wiser served as the foundation to um, creating these dynamic language tool chains, um, like for example, Javi, which is a JavaScript uh, uh, on Wasm toolchain that was the thing that brought support uh, for JavaScript on WebAssembly to Shopify functions. And then the next question came around. Uh, solving the dynamic language problem on Wasm was not necessarily enough. The next question is, can we have smaller modules? Because when you start thinking about dynamic languages on WebAssembly, uh, your modules start getting pretty big. If you're not familiar with this process, this normally involves compiling an engine and then having almost the entire engine in your WebAssembly module. So this tends to create very big modules. Um, but then, thankfully, uh, the process of being able to link two modules together was the answer to this problem. And the way you would do that is that you would have a core or a code module that would link would be linked against an engine module, and then you would be able to detach this process and have a smaller modules that would only contain the code uh, that the user was interested in, in, in running. So you would just uh, save a copy of your engine module in your, in your servers. Um, and so now we fast forward to today. Um, there is a lot of work that's been going on, and you're going to see that in the talks later today, and you saw that in many talks uh, yesterday. But one of the main things is the component model. This is um, helping alleviate many of the challenges that were already presented um, in this talk and that we were thinking about in 2021. Uh, also, a better debugging story in Wasm time is, is coming. Uh, there is a lot of work that's going in there so that we can understand better what the WebAssembly programs are doing in the runtime. And there are some initiatives to bring faster JavaScript on WebAssembly so that we can have a, a better performance and better throughput. So, before ending, I want to go back to all the challenges that I've mentioned and just make an analysis how, this, how these challenges are, are being solved. So authoring programs is, is getting uh, easier and easier uh, as time passes by. There are many tool chains that you can uh, get access to in order to write programs that uh, you know, uh, would compile, uh, would bring support for Python into WebAssembly. Uh, Joel Dice is going to be talking about this later today. Uh, uh, Guy Bedford talked about uh, uh, componentized JS yesterday, and tools like Javi also help um, make this process easier. Understanding programs is also getting easier. As I said, there is a lot of work going in uh, the Biker Alliance to improve the debugging story in Wasm time, but also there are companies like Dialypso doing a lot of work so that you can uh, understand and observe what uh, your programs are doing. And the guest and host interaction is, is going to be alleviated by the component model. Uh, with this, it means that you don't, no longer need uh, to write huge amount of glue code in order to uh, make this uh, interaction between the guest and the host uh, easy to manage. So with that, uh, I think that's everything I have. Thanks.